and American studies. Um, I'm very delighted to see you all here uh, for what promises to be a very informative uh, session. Our guest uh, today is uh, none other than Ambassador Masilo E. Mabeta. Um, Ambassador Mabeta is going to give us a lecture on the topic of national reconciliation and reconstruction in post apartheid South Africa and poverty in rural South Africa. Let me just tell you a little bit about him. Uh, Ambassador Mabeta left South Africa in 1975 to study in the UK and later moved to the United States where he received a political asylum while pursuing graduate studies in government at Harvard University. Uh, he played a crucial role in mobilizing support for the anti-apartheid and divestiture movements against private and public institutions, investing in companies with ties to South African apartheid government. Upon the unbanning of the liberation movements and the release of Nelson Mandela, from prison in 1990, Mabeta returned to South Africa, taking up a teaching position in politics at the University of Transkei, renamed Walter Cecil University. In 1999, he was elected to parliament, where he served in committees on defense, foreign affairs, justice, and constitutional development. In 2003 and 2004, Ambassador Mabeta was selected to be a fellow at Harvard University. Between 2004 and 2015, he served as the first resident South African Ambassador Extraordinary in the Union of Comoros, East Africa, and the Republic of Liberia, West Africa. During his tenure in the Union of Comoros, he was able to ascertain that South Africa's African Union mandate, mandated role for mediating the national reconciliation process was successfully implemented and culminated in the establishment of the constitutional framework for the signing of agreements on shared competencies between the central and island executives and most significantly the holding of successful presidential elections in 2006 and 2010 without challenges to the outcomes by contestants. In Liberia, he set the groundwork for the signing of basic cooperation agreements between the two countries and provided the South African diplomatic team by the United Nations with analysis and updates on the progress of UN military support missions in Liberia's post-conflict national reconstruction program. Ambassador Mabeta is married with four children he lives in South Africa and the United States. Well, when South Africa achieved majority rule in 1994, under the leadership of the late Nelson Mandela, who was politically imprisoned for 27 years because of his stewardship of the anti-apartheid struggle, that momentous occurrence came about as a result of a worldwide anti-apartheid movement. Today's students may not all understand what I mean by the word apartheid. In a nutshell, prior to the emergence of majority rule in 1999 in South Africa, apartheid was the political system that prevailed under which a white minority ruled and oppressed the black majority. Apartheid meant separate development, separate housing, differential compensations for the same work, lack of freedom of movement, lack of the right to vote for the black majority, etc. In the 1980s, a nationwide anti-apartheid movement crystallized in the United States. And that movement sought to it that the United States government imposed economic and military sanctions against the then apartheid regime in South Africa in 1986. Other nations of the world, including the United Nations and the African Union, and also imposed similar sanctions against South Africa. Thus, global forces came together 
to force the hands of the apartheid regime in South Africa and to compel it to launch negotiations with the African National Congress, now the ruling political party in South Africa, which eventually paved way for the new South African constitution and the first national election in which the black majority was allowed to vote. Nelson Mandela emerged the winner and first president of a new and free South Africa in 1994. Our visitor, Ambassador Mandela, will share with us today details of that long South African freedom struggle and details of where the nation is now in terms of its post apartheid experience. Hence, the topic of the day and the topic of this presentation is national reconciliation and reconstruction in post apartheid South Africa and poverty in rural South Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, Ambassador. Equality, freedom of movement, 
speech and association, worker rights, children's rights, and the women's rights. Our people gain the social economic rights such as the right to water, electricity, housing, health, education, social security, and others. And most importantly, 1994 ushered in a new era of hope for all South Africans. A hope that the lives of the people would improve and that South Africa would be a better country than it had ever been. A better country for all those who live in South Africa. And indeed, this has happened in South Africa. South Africa is a better place to live. South Africa has a good story to tell. South Africa is a good story in terms of that global and universal um, journey of a social consciousness about uh, an issue that confronted humanity. Next to that uh, other historical issue that confronted humanity, the movement for the end of imperialism and colonialism decades before 1994. I'm saying this uh, to underline the fact that uh, that uh, election, uh, that vote, that feeling that uh, we had, we shared it with uh, the rest of the world in terms of uh, the universal solidarity that works so tirelessly across um, boundaries, across lines, across different societies to support the struggle for the freedom of the people in South Africa so that South Africa would be a free country, free from racism, free from inequality, no sexism, equal opportunities for all. And they will say thank you to our heroes that has spearheaded this movement in South Africa, the liberation movement headed by our heroes, most of whom are not here today. Quickly, the building of a united democratic and a non-racial and a non-sexist society has uh, uh, entailed the following. Meeting basic needs and developing human resources, building the economy and creating jobs, combating crime and corruption, transforming the state in terms of uh, establishing a constitutionally defined state institutions and uh, building a better Africa and a better world. We have done well on all these pillars in the last 20 years. We have moved closer to our cherished dream of a united, non-racial, non-sexist, democratic, and prosperous South Africa. But then, we must ask the questions. Despite these notable, well-known achievements, what type of challenges are there? Are there any challenges? If any, what's going to happen to those challenges? How are those challenges going to be addressed? Should we have challenges in a free South Africa? Or should we have challenges? I address uh, these uh, questions bearing in mind that South Africa was uh, under one of the most brutal systems of oppression for a very, very long time. And uh, therefore, one would expect that uh, despite any progress that we have made in South Africa, a lot of these problems, a lot of uh, the problems that have to do with uh, rebuilding a new South Africa from the ashes of poverty would still be the all. Fair to say that uh, all the challenges South Africa faces should all have disappeared by now. Fair to say that you know, we don't have any challenges. Somebody needs to be honest about this and state the case of a 
good story in South Africa in an honest, in a clear way, without fear or favor either. The challenges uh, we face in South Africa are mostly the following. On the economic side, we still have 87% of the population still trapped in unemployment because of uh, government inefficiencies in the mobilization and the use of our vast natural resources to improve the life of the poor. This is mainly due to the lack of technical skills and also governance issues. To correct these various technical skills development programs have been taken by our government in order to implement the policy of a radical economic transformation which is being implemented now. One needs to note that the economic growth, while it's very, very slow in South Africa, it requires investment in areas such as manufacturing, building <coughs> factories to increase employment and the intern consumer spending. The third area of challenges is in the area of governance and the corruption in the state-owned companies and that this in turn causes poor performance by these state-owned companies that are meant to have a critical input in the creation of employment and the upliftment of the poor in South Africa. Political problems uh, include the following or evolve around the following issues. The common perception is that leadership is corrupt, derives mainly from the behavior of an individual within the ruling party and within a government. And then this derives from a slow pace or inability to resolve intra-party conflicts and this in turn leads to the formation of factions within major state institutions within a ruling party, within the different sectors of a society. Of course, there is a that has ever present problem of a poor government. And in simple terms, at least in the context of a, um, a lot of African countries, in South Africa in particular, the case that you are addressing now. And this refers to the fact that you have excellent policies on one side, but uh, the implementation pace and mechanism, in other words, the, the operationalization of uh, those processes either takes a long time or is uh, very wasteful or has, uh, 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 or has uh, um, accounting, uh, accounting uh, problems. What does this mean? This means that uh, you end up with the money properly targeted to address the issues of poverty, let's say in a one rural community, let's take the question of water. But then uh, the implementation for the review, for the reticulation of water from point A to point B takes such a long time that uh, uh, people suffer in the process, or the money is uh, Misused, or there are such uh, irregularities that people do not uh, really appreciate the efforts that uh, the government is trying to make to address their needs. It's a management problem. It's a mismanagement problem. On the positive side, 
we have a one important factor that is the separation of powers as clearly stated in the South African Constitution. You have an independent judiciary that cannot be dictated to by the executive. You have a parliament, a parliamentary system that is able to exercise effective oversight over government and the various uh, uh, state institutions in South Africa. Secondly, we have uh, a culture of uh, discussions about uh, corruption and the state capture. For example, what is state capture? The state capture is a system where uh, a coterie of people, or syndicates, or individuals in or out of government that are able to uh, divert state funds for personal use. It also means uh, the illegal manipulation of state institutions of government and the government officials for self-enrichment. It is done by or directed by a small group of persons in and out of government with collusions with government officials. The good thing here is that uh, these activities, these irregular or illegal activities are brought to courts and the investigations are carried out or the intention sometimes is declared that the investigations are going to be carried out. But uh, the important thing here is that uh, the initiatives by civic society, movements, churches, for example, and the offices of the public protector indicates a healthy constitutional democracy, especially given the freedom of the press to report on all of uh, these matters if and when they arise, or if and when they are suspicious that uh, these matters are taking place. The oversight role of parliament over the existing over the executive is, uh, is effective and robust as all political parties are able in various uh, portfolio committee or parliamentary committees are able to effectively exercise their role and uh, to refer matters to the judiciary where they feel that the constitution or parliamentary rules are not properly observed. Also, normal, peaceful, and credible elections are conducted as the Constitution directs. We haven't had, in South Africa, elections in question or elections being declared an unemployed. We have the enlargement of political parties and the further development of a multi-party democracy, which is healthy for broadening the political participation of the citizens in South Africa. So we have a good story to tell in South Africa. Where ordinary people are able to take even the president of the country to court, where irregularities in his office or irregularities that involve him are reported to have taken place. The case in point here is that when investigations were carried out by the public protector and the reports were written that an excessive amount of money was spent in the renovation of uh, his uh, private presidential residence. This went to the court. He agreed and uh, paid the stated amount, seven point something million. Actions that are taken by the executive without a proper explanation to the relevant arms of government or to parliament are questioned. 
in the media, by civic society movements, and that these are addressed the oversight role of parliament over the executive is not determined unilaterally by the head of parliament, the speaker of parliament in South Africa, where opposition parties feel that uh, a different rule should be taken on an issue. And then uh, there are parts uh, there are suspicions that uh, she is not uh, taking on time or as quickly as expected the appropriate action, in this case, a vote on the no confidence debate on uh, the president of the country, where one of the opposition parties took the Speaker of the House to the courts to get the Speaker of the House to exercise his authority and then decide whether the vote would be done in secret or by show of hands. This was done. She acceded to taking the decision and declared that uh, the vote would be held in secret so that, as the opposition, I would be able to feel free to vote as they please. I mention all of these things to highlight the point that where there are disagreements with the executive, where issues of mismanagement or corruption are pointed out, you do not have a situation where people disappear, where people are arrested, the fact that uh, the executive, starting with the president, can be asked crucial questions in parliament during the day, or be required to appear before parliament to answer specific questions on any matter of government, this indicates to the fact that we do have freedom in South Africa, that we do indeed have the maturing and the strengthening of democracy in South Africa. The fact that members of the ruling party are able to differ with the leaders of the ruling party, including the executive, on any issue, on the conduct of the matters of state, and the people are not taken to prison. And people are free to express their different views. Even criticism against the state president. Anybody in writing or publicly as movements or as groups is free to do so, indicate to the fact that the South Africa will have gone a long way in the further development and hopefully the final improvement of democracy in our country. And therefore we do have, in my view, and in the view of quite a number of people in South Africa and around the world, Despite the economic problem, despite the fact that uh, you still have poverty in South Africa, despite the fact that uh, the promises made by government to address the issues that uh, affect the most vulnerable in South Africa in health provision of uh, services in education. The point is that these things that can be addressed, criticisms can be made, and this means we live in a free country. And therefore, one feels it is fair 
to say South Africa has a good story to tell. South Africa has played, in addition to these domestic matters, a very critical role in its foreign policy, in the promotion of a democracy in Africa. South Africa has been asked by the UN, the United Nations, the African Union, to be a lead country in mediating and assisting in resolving conflicts in various countries. And these conflicts have been mediated for the most part very, very successfully. A case in point, for example, the Union of Comoros and many, many other countries. They saw it very good. South Africa serves on many international bodies, on different organs of the United Nations system. But what I think is the problem here is that uh, criticism against the conduct of certain individuals within the ruling party or certain individuals within government will tend to overshadow a lot of the progress that has been made. Is that a being an apologist for the government by pointing this out? No. I think it is just being honest and being fair and saying, yes, there are challenges. But you must look at those challenges. However serious these challenges are, however disappointing these challenges are, against the progress that the government has made in addressing the structural, the structure of the economy, the structural elements of the system of apartheid in South Africa. I thank you very much. I would like uh, uh, Professor Okombe to hand over to you, and then uh, you are free to um, to uh, raise one or two questions as a bridge. Thank you. Well, let's give another round of applause to uh, Visitor Ambassador Mandela.
uh, citizens of South Africa and then to make a difference. One of the things that I'm working on, well, I work on a few different projects, but one of the projects that I had a desire to do, uh, I'll give you a little background. We visited um, some schools in the rural areas of South Africa, and I don't know if there are any uh, education majors here, but we visited a school, uh, several schools in South Africa, the rural areas, and I found or was told or informed that some of the children were walking one to two to five miles, elementary school age children, to obtain an education. And that was, I have pictures, and that was really heartbreaking because some of us, we have opportunities for an education and we refuse to take it. So one of the things that I'm currently working on is a bicycle project for the kids, children of South Africa. I'm trying to raise a thousand bicycles, new or used or whatnot, to send over there. So if any of you are interested in joining, to assisting or whatnot, then I'll leave my email address and you can contact me other via email. But there's such a need over there that you would be, um, you'd be surprised. So there are things that uh, we throw away, uh, things that we don't use that they can very well use. But the issue that you would have is getting it open. And what I found is that uh, in order to get it there most efficiently, it, and it is, uh, you would have to lease a container on a ship and send it that way, as opposed to using the airlines to do it, because that's very expensive. Something else I'd like to speak about is, uh, and I hope I'm not jumping the, the gun on this, but Ambassador Mabata has informed me that he and his wife will be starting a school in the rural areas of South Africa next year. So with that in mind, some of you should, I would encourage you to latch on to that idea and attempt to assist him any way that you have, any way that you can, to make it spread the word. Because there's power numbers, as you guys know, and we are very resourceful beyond um, our imagination if we choose to put that into motion or action. Um, I would encourage each of you to visit South Africa in some way, shape, or form. I plan to go back next year and do some things over there. But uh, my overall experience is very pleasant. I'm thankful that I had the opportunity to uh, travel with Dr. Coffin and to meet Ambassador Lovetta. Can I call my <laughs> awesome. And if it weren't for Dr. Alcafo, this would have never happened, and it definitely has changed my life and my perspective on not only <laughs> South Africa, but the world. Thank you. Thank you. Any reflections? Well, thank you very much for coming, and uh, I want to remind you uh, that. Um, our department uh, offers a bachelor's degree in African American Studies, that is a major of 33 credits. We also offer a minor. Uh, and we, in addition, offer an undergraduate certificate in African Studies, 12 credits, and a graduate certificate in African American Studies, 15 credits. As we speak, uh, we are in the process of getting a proposal for a master's degree in Africology and African American Studies being uh, approved. That process is ongoing. Um, and um, our major allows or permits students to double major. So uh, even if you already have a major, consider double majoring also in African American Studies. So, in addition to our major, our annual, our certificate programs, we also contribute courses to general education. We have AFC 101, Introduction to African American Studies, which can be used and is used to meet uh, U.S. diversity requirement in the general education program. We have AFC 232, Politics in the African American Experience, which also counts towards the diversity. We have AFC 2 for the four dimensions of racism, which counts in two areas, uh, global awareness and knowledge of these disciplines, social science. We have AFC 351, 
the social context of African American health, which comes in the area of knowledge of the disciplines, social science. And we have um, uh, uh, an intensive writing course, AFC 362, uh, uh, which uh, can be used to meet uh, the writing intensive requirement of general education. And finally, we have uh, an internship course, which can be used not only for purposes of meeting our internship requirement, but also for satisfying uh, learning beyond the classroom and requirements for uh, EMU's bachelor's degree program. We are a student-friendly department, and uh, we have an open-door policy 